John chapter 18. And we'll begin reading back in uh, verse 15. And then I think rather than, uh, I don't know if this is going to throw a monkey wrench in uh, our reading here, but instead of rereading verses 19 through 24, well, no, I'll just go ahead and read it because it's going to remind us of something that we need to think about what we saw this morning. In John chapter 18, beginning in verse 15, we read this. Simon Peter was following Jesus, and so was another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter was standing at the door outside, so the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. Then the slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the officers were standing there, having made a charcoal fire, for it was cold and they were warming themselves, and Peter was also with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered them, I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together, and I spoke nothing in secret. Why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I, uh, what I spoke to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the officers standing nearby struck Jesus, saying, Is that the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong. But if rightly, why do you strike me? So Annas uh, sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest, or as we saw this morning, now Annas had sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, so they said to him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied it again, and immediately a rooster crowed. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now, we've just been reminded, at least part of what we saw this morning, that after Jesus was arrested and after he was bound, that he was led away first to Annas and then to Caiaphas, where he was put on trial. The high priest first tried to get him to incriminate himself. And of course, we saw Jesus' response that you shouldn't ask me what it is that I've said but rather ask those who heard because my ministry has been a public ministry. If you have witnesses, bring them and they'll testify as to what I've said. The high priest next tried to find false witnesses. We saw this in Matthew chapter 26 who would be willing to testify against him, but none of them seemed to agree and you had to have at least two that would agree on the charges. Uh, It seems as though the Lord was thwarting their efforts to sin against him by trumping up false charges. Finally, the high priest invoked the authority that was his according to God's law, requiring Jesus to testify to who he was. And Jesus told him, told him the truth. He was the Messiah, the Son of God, and for that they condemned him. Now this evening we see that while Jesus was busy at this trial righteously defending himself against these three unrighteous attacks of the high priest, Peter was sadly busy in the courts outside, unrighteously denying that he even knew Jesus three times in order to save his own life. Now this text does teach us that even true believers can fall into sin, but it also shows us that when they do fall into sin, they turn from those sins and continue to obey the Lord. And the reason they do is because Jesus prays for them. He prays for us. Now what I'd like to do is look at three things. First of all, I want us to pay attention to the fact that Peter followed Jesus, that he followed him to where he was being put on trial because he was concerned about him. He cared about him. Secondly, I want us to see that Peter denied Jesus, and he did that because he 
in the moment of weakness, he fell into sin in order to save his own life. And we're going to take a closer look at that. But thirdly, what it is we should learn from these things. Now, first of all, we see that Peter followed Jesus. We read in verse 15, Simon Peter was following Jesus, and so was another disciple. Now, that disciple was known to the high priest and entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. Now, remember what happened in the garden. Uh, Jesus was arrested. The disciples all fled, even as Jesus said they would. But not all of them ran to hide. We see here that at least Peter and one other disciple followed Jesus. Now, they didn't follow right on his on his tail, as it were, but rather from a distance. At least we're told that in Matthew 26, 58. But they were concerned. One mark of a true child of God is that he or she will follow the shepherd wherever he goes because they love the shepherd. Now, it is true that the disciples had run away when the soldiers had come to arrest Jesus. They weren't willing at that time openly to acknowledge him, but that doesn't mean that none of them were concerned for Jesus. They were all concerned for Jesus. Peter certainly was, and so he followed him. Now, this other disciple, as I mentioned earlier in the series, uh, may have been John. As a matter of fact, I was thinking up until I came to this text that that's exactly who it was, and many do see that this is John, because John... Uh, never actually refers to himself in the gospel. He never calls himself by name, but rather he refers to himself in his gospel without mentioning his name. And this looks like another one of those examples. And certainly it was often the case that Peter and John were together. They were in that inner circle, Peter, James, and John. But some raise the issue of how John, who was basically a fisherman, knew the high priest and was known by the high priest and would have all these privileges and uh, that he would have them, but James wouldn't. I mean, especially because they were fishermen. So on that basis, they argue that we need to remember there were other disciples besides the, the 12, which have been now pared down to 11 because Judas has denied Jesus. Uh, this could have been a disciple that was known to the high priest, and we know a couple of them that were very... Uh, very obvious in Scripture that we've been introduced to in the book of John, such as Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea. But whoever this disciple was, he was known to the high priest, and so he was able to enter with Jesus into the court. And another thing that might be in favor of the fact that this wasn't John is that this particular disciple wasn't put on trial like Peter was. Hey, weren't you with Jesus, you know, this apparently was a disciple who kept his discipleship perhaps a bit more secret. And again, that would describe Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. Well, this disciple, realizing that Peter didn't have the same freedom to come into the court with him, and knowing how desperately Peter wanted to know how things were progressing uh, with his Lord, this disciple graciously used his relationship with the high priest to allow Peter to enter. We read in verse 16, but Peter was standing at the door outside. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. Now we're going to see that that's basically a two-edged sword, isn't it? Because now it brought Peter, it brought him to a place where he could see what was going on with Jesus. And again, he wanted to see what was going on with Jesus. But now he was also going to be closer to the enemy to those who might know him and might recognize him and therefore more liable to be tested or put to the test as to whether or not he's going to follow through with what he told Jesus earlier he would do, which is, I will never deny you, Lord, even if I have to die with you. Well, next we see that Peter denies Jesus three times. First of all, he denied Jesus to the doorkeeper. We read in verse 17, then the slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. 
Now, we don't really know whether the doorkeeper recognized Peter that he knew or that a slave girl actually knew that Peter was one of Jesus' disciples or maybe just suspected that he might be because perhaps the way he was acting. But either way, she asked and he denied. Well, secondly, Peter denied Jesus before the slaves and the officers. We read in verse 18. Now the slaves and the officers were standing there having made a charcoal fire, for it was cold, and they were warming themselves, and Peter was also with them, standing and warming himself. Now, the most obvious reason why Peter was standing there with the, with the slaves and the officers, and by the way, who were these slaves and officers but the same group that just brought Jesus from Gethsemane? Um, if anyone's going to recognize Peter, it would be them. But why was Peter standing with them? Well, because he was cold. But it's also possible that after what the gatekeeper said, he was trying to blend in so he wouldn't be singled out. Uh, sometimes the safest place to hide is in plain sight. But on this occasion, it didn't work. Uh, they asked him the same question that the doorkeeper asked in verse 25. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, so they said to him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. I couldn't help but share, uh, but share this um, particular insight of Matthew Henry. He sees uh, a spiritual analogy in this that I think is very helpful, especially in light of what we're looking at this evening. Where are we going to find the strength to profess the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, this is what Henry writes. Those that warm themselves with evildoers grow cold towards good people and good things. And those that are fond of the devil's fireside are in danger of the devil's fire. The more that you warm your heart or your heart is warm toward the things that are contrary to God's will, the colder it is going to be towards His will and the more difficult it's going to be to do what He actually calls us to do. And really, that is true. Another thing that Henry notes is that Satan, when he gains ground with us in some area, will double his attack or basically redouble his attacks against us. Peter first compromises with the doorkeeper and now he finds himself in an even worse situation. Now he's confronted by the slaves and, and the, uh, uh, these officers. Now the Bible says that the fear of man brings a snare. Jesus says in Matthew 10:28. Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, the problem that Peter was faced with here was that he feared man, and it brought a snare to him. He denied his Lord. He did not fear God as he should have, and so he denies a second time that he even knows the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the third time... Peter is clearly confronted with somebody who was an eyewitness, somebody who was present in the garden. It's possible these slaves and these, these officers were, but maybe not. But we read in verse 26, one of the slaves of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, said, did I not see you in the garden with him? If anybody's going to take note of whose ear got cut off, it's going to be a person who's related to that person whose ear was cut off. And here, that slave was a slave or a servant of the high priest. Now, here is a relative of that slave who said, I saw you in the garden. Or did I not see you in the garden? But then we see in verse 27, Peter then denied it again. And immediately, a rooster crowed. Now, remember, Jesus, just earlier that evening, it hasn't been very long, told Peter that he would deny three times that very night that he even knew him before a rooster crowed or crowed twice. Peter insisted that even if he had to die with Jesus, he would never deny him. Well, Jesus was right, and Peter was, was wrong. While Jesus was inside bearing witness to the truth 
before those whose one goal was to kill him. Peter was outside lying to save his own skin. And something we need to recognize that Peter was ashamed of for the rest of his life. You know, when we commit sins, God forgives those sins, but when we look back at them, we can never say, oh, I'm glad I did that. We're always going to be ashamed of what it is that, that we have done that is dishonoring to our Lord, even though the Lord will use these things to bring good things out of it. We can be happy for that, but we'll always be ashamed by the sin. Now, what is it that we should learn from these events or from Peter's fall? Well, we should learn, first of all, that even true believers can fall into sin. That's, that's no mystery. Now, we do want to understand Peter's denial was not recorded, it was not put in here by the gospel writers to excuse our sin or to give us an excuse to sin. Hey, I can just sin and the Lord will forgive me. There was a, uh, somebody I knew years ago who... Um, uh, he was confronted in a situation where somebody was threatening him. Uh, if he was a Christian, he was going to attack him. And uh, he said, well, I'll just deny Jesus now and I'll just repent later and, and that will take care of the problem. Well, that doesn't take care of the problem because to deny the Lord Jesus Christ is a very significant and serious sin. But this instance of Peter's denial of the Lord Jesus Christ is put in Scripture to show us that even when we do commit sins of this magnitude, the Lord in His love and in His mercy will still forgive us. Now, Peter, though he was flawed in many different ways, certainly showed himself to be a true believer. He had followed the Lord Jesus Christ for the past three and a half years. They went through a lot of experiences together and a lot of difficulties together. And, you know, there's a lot of things we could look back on and see that um, the Lord taught Peter during that time. And certainly there were times when Peter blew it rather significantly, when Jesus had to rebuke him to his face, get behind me, Satan. Or and on the other occasion, of course, where Peter tried to defend him in the garden, again, trying to keep him from go to, going to Calvary. He still meant well in those circumstances. He loved the Lord Jesus. He clearly loved Him. And even after he ran away, when Jesus was arrested, he still followed Him. And he went into the enemy's camp because he was concerned about what was happening to Jesus. He wanted to know what was happening to his Lord. And we also need to recognize that when Peter denied Jesus, he didn't justify himself in what he had done. Well, if I hadn't, I would have been put to death, and so I did the right thing. He didn't, you know, the means don't justify the end. What he did was still wrong. It's not recorded in John's gospel, but it is in the others that once, Jesus had, or once Peter had denied Jesus three times, he went out and wept bitterly because he knew how horribly he had failed Jesus, and that in light of his very bold promise that even though everybody else deny you, Lord, I will not deny you. And even if I have to go to death, I will die with you gladly. And when it comes down to it, he denies him. Even though G he clearly loved Jesus, we see that he fell into sin. But now the next question is why? Why did Peter deny Jesus? Well, the most obvious answer is he was afraid of dying. He didn't want to be put to death with Jesus. He just didn't have the strength to resist. Now, it is true that on one of these three occasions, he denies Jesus before a servant girl. But we, let's not forget where that servant girl was. I mean, she was the doorkeeper in the court of the high priest, and the, and the court happened to be full of servants and officers. And all she had to do was point the finger at him and they would have been right on him. So I think Peter wasn't just thinking about the servant girl. I think he was thinking about the danger that was there. But why was he so afraid when on other occasions, I mean, even in the garden, he stood up with a sword and, and wanted to defend Jesus against that same group? What was going on here? And why were all these things falling against him in this way? Why did they all go against him? Well, let's not forget what Jesus had said earlier in Luke's gospel, chapter 22, verse 31. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. We need to understand what was going on behind the scenes 
who it was that was provoking the question of the servant girl, of the servants and officers, and of the servant of the high priest, who it was that was intensifying Peter's fears. It was the devil himself. That's a pretty formidable adversary. Peter didn't yet have the strength to stand against this kind of temptation, likely because he was not yet filled with the Spirit of God. And so he fell into this terrible sin. Now, considering what Jesus had, well, what Jesus had done for Peter and what he had called Peter to do during those, those three and a half years, go out and preach the gospel, tell them all that the kingdom of heaven is here because the Messiah is here. What Jesus had clearly also said about those who deny him, what could Peter reasonably expect for what he had just done to Jesus, that he had denied him? And again, I'll just draw your attention to what we read in our meditation of this warning that Jesus gave to his disciples. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is what Peter deserved for the sin. I mean, it was not a small sin. It was a great sin. Actually, any sin deserves this, but particularly great sins. And this is likely what Satan was the first to point out to Peter, which is likely why he also wept. You know, it's so easy to justify sin when we're under temptation. I had to do it, Lord, to save my life. But you see, that's the nature of sin. Sin is deceitful. But once the sin is committed, the tempter then turns into the accuser and uses our failures to drive us away from the Lord. And I think Peter experienced a good measure of that. Peter denied the Lord because he was being sifted by the evil one like wheat. But the second thing we need to understand from this, of course, is how great a love the Savior has for his, his own. Uh, Jesus had not only told Peter about Satan's desire to sift him, he also told Peter what it is that he had done for him to help him and to protect him. We read in Luke 22, verse 32, But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Now, it's interesting what Jesus prayed. I mean, this, this is interesting, isn't it? Because Jesus didn't pray that Peter would be kept from temptation. As a matter of fact, that's not what the Lord is praying for us either. He didn't pray that he would stand in it in, on this particular occasion, although I do believe the Lord is praying that we would be able to stand on most occasions. He prayed that after Peter had fallen into the sin, uh, as Jesus, of course, knew that he was going to, that his faith would not fail, particularly as the tempter becomes the accuser. And when he had turned again, when he had repented of that sin, that he would be used to strengthen his brothers in Christ. Now, one thing we do have to admit is that this was a lesson that our Lord wanted Peter to learn. And I think that lesson was... Don't rely on yourself and on your own abilities, your own supposed ability to stand. You need to rely on, on me, Jesus is saying, uh, and on my intercession, on my mediation, on my strength. And I, we, I think we'd have to assume that Peter would undoubtedly draw on this event, on this fall, and his recovery for years to come. The Lord works good out of our falls into sin. Sometimes we have to fall into sin in order for him to teach us what he wants us to learn. Now, the difference between a believer who falters and sins against the Lord and the unbeliever that does the same thing is that the believer repents, as we see Peter here repented. He doesn't want to continue down that road. He doesn't want to live that kind of life. He wants to please his Lord. Lord. 
but the unbeliever doesn't. And so he justifies his sin rather than repenting of his sin. But the reason why the believer repents is because Jesus prays for him. He doesn't pray for the unbeliever. He prays for those who trust in him. That's what Jesus was doing. Remember in John chapter 17, he prayed that the Father would keep us safe. When he left, that the Father would protect us. He would send the other comforter also to guide and to protect and to do the same thing that Jesus did while he was on the earth with his disciples. He says in John 17, verses 11 through 12, I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. The reason why Peter repented, the reason why we repent, is because Jesus prays for us. Now, as Christians, we fail, like Peter, we fail. We perhaps fail more often than Peter did. We fall into sin. Even after Pentecost, even after the giving of the Holy Spirit, even after that which Peter didn't have, we need to recognize that Peter, even after Pentecost, continued to fall. He fell on other occasions as well. And we fall after Pentecost. But we don't continue in sin. We repent. We fight to overcome our sins and to put those sins to death. And the reason why we do that is because we love the Lord. And the reason why we love Him and the reason why we repent and we'll continue to do so until we finally arrive in heaven is because the Lord loves us and because He prays for us. That's the reason why we're not going to fall. It's not because we can say to ourselves or believe in ourselves that we have the strength to do what the Lord wants us to do because we don't in and of ourselves. We need His grace, but Jesus prays that we might have it. He prays that we might be one, that we might have the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit, and one day be with Him in heaven. And that's the only reason why we're going to be there, the only reason why Peter also finally arrived in heaven. If you love the Lord, if you trust the Lord, if you're following the Lord, if you're repenting of your sins, that is what He is doing for you, and that is why you love Him, and that is why you are repenting, is because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But let me just say in closing, if you don't love Him, if you're not following Him, you need the Lord's work, otherwise you're not going to make it. You need to pray that the Lord would put that love in your heart. You need to pray that the Lord would have mercy upon you. You need to pray that He would give you His Spirit and that He would pray for you, that the work that He did, that He would do that for you. That's the only way that anyone is really going to make it to heaven. Well, let's, um, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to take what we've heard and, and apply it and encourage us and reprove us or whatever it is we need from what it is He's said.